Today the Trekkers are taking you to Southwest Virginia where we'll be talking all about how the early settlers in this area had conflicts with Indians. Our first stop is right outside Radford where we're going to visit the English farm. So we're in the Valley and Ridge region and this region as you know was settled by the Scotch-Irish and they came down from Pennsylvania along the Wilderness Road which is now I-81, well it's close to I-81 which is what me and Alfonso are traveling down. And Philadelphia was the biggest port at the time and that's when all the um, immigrants came in. They came into Philadelphia and so they settled around the Pennsylvania area. But they found some rich land over here in Virginia so they traveled down Wilderness Road and that's where tradition begins. That's right and we're going to be learning all about the contributions that the Scotch-Irish and the German brought to this area to make it a very unique part of Virginia. So buckle down and let's get ready to find out some of these contributions and have a little fun. Yeehaw! So here we are near Radford and there's a very famous site called the Ingalls Farm where something exciting happened between the Indians and the early settlers. Now there are different kind of Ingalls. A long time ago Dave and I grew up with an Ingalls with Little House on the Prairie. Many of your teachers probably know that. But this is a different Ingalls that we're going to learn about. So let's go find out what happened to the Ingalls family. Let's go. Mary Ingalls was born to Scotch-Irish immigrants in the town of Philadelphia in 1732. In 1743, her family migrated across the Great Wagon Road into the Valley Ridge region of Virginia. Then they continued along the Wilderness Road, going further down to where they settled in Draper's Meadow near Blacksburg. And this is where she met William Ingalls and they got married. They had two boys, Thomas and George. One hot July morning in 1775, while Mary's husband was out working in the fields, the Shawnee Indians attacked their small settlement. They killed Mary's mom and several other people and took Mary and her two sons captive, along with others. They burned down the village and took them on a long journey. The Shawnee Nation lived in Ohio, so these Indians were taking her there. They traveled along the New River up until they got to the border of Ohio, where there was a Shawnee village. Once there, her two sons, Thomas and George, were taken away from her, and she was sold to French traders. They took her further west to a place called Big Bone Lick, Kentucky, and I've been there. It's called a lick because there was a lot of salt there. It was a salt lick, and salt was very important, and that was Mary's job, to make salt. And it was called Big Bone because there was a lot of big bones there from a long time ago when mammoths and mastodons lived here. Of course, Mary missed her family a lot, so one day in October, she bravely escaped and followed the river all the way back until she reached Draper's Meadow. It was a long journey in late fall, October, and November, so it was cold, she didn't have a lot to eat, but she made it. And the tale of her escape is so amazing, they've even written a book about it that you could check out from the library. She had, she suffered hunger, she suffered um, with all the brambles scratching her clothes. They said by the time she finally arrived back in Virginia, after traveling, they say between 700 and 900 miles and 42 days, she was half starved, her clothing was in rags, and surprisingly, the first person that found her was her original neighbor back where she used to live in Draper's Valley. After Mary's old neighbor miraculously found her, she was reunited with her husband, and they settled here what is now known as Radford. And their farm was right by the New River, and they had a service for the people traveling along the Wilderness Road to ferry them across the New River to the other side. And this was an important stop along the Wilderness Road for those early settlers. So it turned out pretty good. And the Ingalls family is still adding generations and still living on their farm. That's amazing. Let's go find another site, Alfonso. Let's go. We have a lot of trekking to do. So the trekkers are leaving the Ingalls farm and we're heading further southwest into Scott County where another Indian attack happened near Gate City. There's a gap in the mountains called Moccasin Gap. You can see the gap right here. All right, well, we've stopped along the highway. You can tell by all the cars passing through. But this was a very important part to stop with. This part that we're in is a gap in Clinch Mountain. It's called Big Moccasin Gap. And the Indians were the first ones to form a trail through this area as a way to go west. And then Daniel Boone made this into a bigger road, part of the Wilderness Road. The Wilderness, the wilderness Road is a long road, so this is part of it. So Dave and I are going to continue to drive up the Wilderness Road and see what we find. 
And there was an important line right here that was from a treaty that separated the settlers' land from the Indians' land. And unfortunately, the settlers often broke that treaty and started settling over into Indian land, which caused much of the conflict that we've been talking about. Isn't that the case? People just can't stay on their side. That's right. So get off my side, Alfonso. <laughs> and just like the Indians and the settlers after them, the trekkers are taking the same road through the gap. All right, so here I am just outside of Moccasin Gap where a settler named Elisha Ferris settled with his family. And it was a stop along the Wilderness Road for settlers to stop and get refreshment. But during the summer of 1791, the Cherokee Indians attacked his family and killed several members and also captured several members. And the leader of that attack was named Chief Bench. And we're gonna be talking about him later on in our video. But Chief Bench was a Cherokee Indian who terrorized this whole area. And parents would even tell their kids, if you don't behave, Chief Bench will get you. So now, it's time to eat a Long John Silver's. Hey Dave, your fish sandwich is ready. After a good meal at Long John Silver's, the trekkers headed out to another gap in the mountain called Big Stone Gap. And it was near this spot where the famous Chief Bench was killed after he attacked another family. All right, Dave mentioned earlier in the podcast about Chief Bench. Well, Chief Bench's father was Scottish and his mother was Cherokee. That means he had red hair and he wasn't full Indian. This spot here marks the end of Chief Bench. That's right, we've been talking all about how he was terrorizing the settlers out here, attacking them, because he wanted to get rid of the white men from Cherokee territory. Well, on April 6, 1794, he attacked the home of Peter Livingston, captured uh, some of his family members, and was taking them on a long journey. Three days later, Peter Livingston had gathered up some militia men here in, in the county, and they attacked them, and they killed Chief Bench with the first shot. And when word got out that Chief Bench was killed, everyone celebrated because they felt a little bit safer. Now we're going to leave Bench's Gap and head over to Lee County near the Cumberland Gap where we're going to show you an old Indian mound. Now this may not look very significant to you, but it's actually the best preserved Indian mound here in Virginia. And Indian mounds were built by Indians called the Mound Builders. And sometimes they use their mounds for graves, like you can see in this example. And other times their mounds were used for temples or important buildings, like you can see in this picture of a mound village. Now you see that little hump under that white building there? That's actually a famous Indian mound. And it's one of the only Indian mounds here in Virginia. And what they did, the Indian tribe that built that mound, they think that there was probably a temple on it or an important building. And that's different from all the tribes you've learned about because you've learned that the Powhatan and the Siouan and the Cherokee, they didn't, they didn't have mounds with important buildings on top of them. So they think that this was actually another tribe, that this was their furthest north trading post. So it's a very significant part of the Indians right here in Lee County, Virginia. Oh, hello, Dave. And here comes Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone. To tell us about the Daniel Boone Trail, which we're standing on right now. I noticed you're talking about the Indian Mound, and that's on our way down the old wilderness trail that I was blazing early in the years. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about that over at this monument built for you, Daniel Boone. Well, come on, bring your camera there. Boys and girls, in the late 1700s, we had many migrants coming in, or early settlers, and they were coming from German, they were the Scotch-Irish, and we had over 300,000 of these new settlers. Well, the Indians already had paved a small path through the Cumberland Gap. What I did was come and made it a little bit wider for these settlers to come through. Now, we came in through some conflict, Daniel Boone did. In fact, the Indians did kill his son while he was paving this road. Not paving as in our roads today, but just widening the existing trail. But eventually, the settlers came in, established their forts that we've been talking about. This monument here was erected just for Daniel Boone, and it kind of symbolizes his path from North Carolina to Virginia, all the way to Kentucky. And boys and girls, you would not believe how hard it was to find this mound 
because as you know, we're in the Valley and Ridge region and there are tons of mounds everywhere. But Alfonso and I finally found this sign to let us know we were in the right place. And here's another sign we found telling all about Daniel Boone and the Wilderness Trail that he paved for the early settlers. And we also found nearby a fort that was built in the 1700s to protect the people from the Indians. Well, the sun's going down. This is going to have to be our last stop along the Wilderness Road for tonight. But this was actually the first stop for the settlers entering the dangerous air, um, Indian territory. So John Anderson in 1775 built this blockhouse for protection for his family, to store ammunition, and also protection for the settlers who were passing through. And Daniel Boone was in charge of many of these type of uh, forts, and he continued to pave the way down the Wilderness Road. And Daniel Boone, his dad gave him a rifle at the age of 12, and it wasn't just a couple years later that he was a master rifleist and a master hunter and fighting the Indians. If it wasn't for Daniel Boone, boys and girls, the settlers wouldn't have had a way through this wilderness. So we're thankful to him. And now we got to show you this beautiful sunset that's over here. It is gorgeous. Let's go take a look. Wow. Look at that. That's nice, man. Well, we've come to the end of another exciting day. It has been busy. We have been rushed, but we've tried to hit as many different spots as we can on our way to the tip of Virginia. And tomorrow we're taking you into the Appalachian Plateau region. It's our second time there, so we're looking forward to that. So for now, we bid you a good night until tomorrow. And you better behave or Chief Benj will get you. And now the trekkers are heading through the Cumberland Gap to our hotel. And as you can see, it's no longer a trail through a gap in the mountains. It's a tunnel right through the mountains.